Hello, my name is Peter Fisher. I'm a physical therapist at the UCSF Medical Center in San Francisco. Together with my colleague Cheryl Levitt, I will introduce to you the concept of DIAM today. DIAM stands for Distance and Inclination Measurement Equipment, and it is a tool that I invented and which is patent pending since December 92. I will first describe the structure, function, operation, and finally demonstrate some of the various applications which is possible with this tool. Here you see the tool by itself, the suspension apparatus that is used to suspend it around the examiner's neck, two palpation ends that fit into the end of the measuring arms right here, and two pointed ends that fit into the same arms. The tool is basically a combination of a dial caliper and an inclinometer. It will measure the distance and inclination between two landmarks that are contacted with the ends of the measuring arms right here. The dial caliper is this top portion. The distance between the ends of the arms can be read on this dial right here, which I show, will show later in, in a close-up. The inclinometer is attached to the bottom of the housing and can be released. It's just held there by a little magnet. Now you can see it hangs freely and it will always align itself vertically, which is very important because if not always the same plane is measured, you will get different measurements of the same inclination. The camera has about the view that the therapist will have on the tool when the therapist is using the tool. So now you can read the inclination on this dial and you can read the distance between the ends of the measuring arm right here. If I move this closer to the camera you can see how the needle is moving around in the dial, caliper dial and showing you the distance. The little needle here the inclinometer is hard to see with a camera right now. If I don't need the inclinometer, I will just fold it back under the housing and it will arrest there with a magnet. This end of the suspension apparatus will later be attached to the top of the housing right here. I would say that the most important novelty with this tool are these palpation ends that can be inserted into the end of the measurement arms. Through these little openings, the surface of the body, in our case the skin of the patient, can be palpated directly. That means that I can measure while I palpate the landmarks which relationship I want to measure. An advantage of this is obviously time. It will be much quicker than palpating a landmark, marking it, and then applying a tool. And I think that it will be also more accurate because you avoid the phenomenon of this marked skin moving relative to the landmark under it that you actually want to measure. In some trial measurements that I've done, the standard deviation for measuring intertestor reliability of the inclination between PSIS and ASIS, which means pelvic alignment, which was far better than the two other studies that I read. This might be partially due to some specific experiment setups, but I think that this also proved that the tool by itself is very accurate. Now this has to be determined if it was just the, the tool Various things about the tool could accomplish this. One thing is that the inclinometer always aligns itself vertical, which I have not seen in any other of the biomechanical measurement tools, the mechanical ones. Or, as I said, pointed out the advantages of these palpation ends. Here's how the therapist will prepare him or herself for measurement. First, the suspension device is attached around the neck. Next, the tool is attached to the suspension device, and you're ready. Now it depends on at which level of the body the therapist wants to measure. 
I can pull it to that desired level and just leave it there. Or I can bring it back higher up if needed. And I have my hands free for patient safety or to record some data. And once I'm at the level that I want, I will just free the inclinometer and I'm ready to measure. First application, and I'm going to measure cervical forward bending and backward bending. I attach the palpation ends to the tool now, and I'm going to con contact the nasion and the spinous process of C2. I'll bring the tool to the right level, about here. And I'm going to contact the nasion and the spinous process of C2. And now Cheryl is going to bend forward, forward bend, and and backward bend. Good. And both measurements are shown on the inclinometer of the tool while she does this. Okay. We can also measure cervical side bending by palpating the mastoid processes. And now Cheryl bends towards the left side and towards the right side. I can read the inclination between these two points on my inclinometer. Okay, next I'm going to demonstrate how to measure pelvic alignment, anterior iliac rotation, the way it is statically aligned as well as the range of motion that you can go through with an anterior and posterior pelvic tilt. That was actually the reason why I invented the tool to start with, because I learned um, the standard evaluation technique that I was just palpate um, the ASIS and the PSIS and then I imagined the line between my fingers and tried to estimate what the inclination is and what, with those little deviations that occur there that was just too inaccurate that's why I came about making doing this whole thing so I'll take the tool attach it and I have to do nothing different than I did originally. I'm still going to palpate just through the end of these arms, but I will get a precise reading. So let's see. ASIS and PSIS. And she has eight degrees here. Now, what is good about this is that I can also see the distance between those two points, because if I now go and repeat this measurement. On the other side, and she has eight degrees there as well, so she's symmetrical on both sides. Um, that tells me if one side was inclined more than the other, then I could assume that there might be an SI dysfunction. Um, if the distance between left and right PSIS and ASS was different, then there might be a bony asymmetry and I might not rely on those landmarks. That's why it's good not to only have the inclination between the two points, but also the distance. Of course, I could now also go ahead if I just wanted to measure, for example, if I do postural re-education and I just want to see in how much degrees of pelvic tilt does this patient stand, I can record this and later record if the patient improves, um, as well as measuring range of motion. So uh, Cheryl now does a posterior pelvic tilt, and she is about at 12 degrees there, and then she does an anterior, degree, anterior pelvic tilt, and she goes to 16 degrees in the other direction. That gives me the range of motion. Now, if I want to measure if one iliac crest or the PSIS or the ASS are elevated to see if there's a leg length discrepancy or to conclude on um, an anterior rotation of one ilium, I can do this as well. So I can contact the iliac crest or I could contact the PSISs. Now, the advantage of this tool compared to the pelvic levels that you um, see in some physical therapy practices is that I know the inclination exactly. I know the angle as well as the distance. And so now I could calculate exactly how much, how much centimeters 
one point is higher by using the trigonomic formula, um, multiplying the distance by the sine value of the angle. Next, we're going to demonstrate how to measure malleolar torsion. And this is of importance with all patellofemoral problems, um, mechanical dysfunctions of the subtalar joint with the ankle joint, everything that concerns the lower extremity. Podiatrists measure this a lot, physical therapists, and here's how we do it. We attach the tool again. And I contact both medial and lateral malleolus, I palpate it, and I can read the inclination of the line between the medial and the lateral malleolus. Before I conduct this measurement, I will also always make sure that the knee flexion axis is horizontal, because then I know how much this axis is turned relative to the knee flexion axis. Finally, I want to show you how to measure bone length. So far, this has traditionally been done with tape measure, but there you have the disadvantage that the tape itself has some elasticity to it, and also that you always measure around soft tissue curves, so you will never get the accurate bone length underneath and this is especially bad if you have asymmetric conditions like one side you have a muscle atrophy. Of course you can't beat, hardly can beat extra. Okay, so in this, for an example, I'm going to show you how to measure um, tibial length. I already marked the two landmarks which I need to do like it's done traditionally if I use these pointed ends. The reason why I want to might measure tibial length can have many reasons. Could be a back problem, could be an SI problem, and I want to rule out that there's a leg length discrepancy. Um, if I just want to measure distance, I will not need the inclinometer here, so I'll just clean it up by putting it on the bottom of the housing. So now I contact my two landmarks. And she's got 34.2 centimeters here. So you can see that the dime has a lot of possibilities of application. You can measure cervical range of motion, pelvic alignment, range of motion, bone length, malleolar torsion, and you might think of some applications that I have not thought of. Scoliometer, for, exa for example. Okay, that's all.